Anyway, I, I won't need it for the introduction. I'm delighted to see you all here. I'm Edie Miller. I'm part of the, the OLLI um, program committee. And by the way, we could uh, we would love to have additional support for OLLI if there are any of you who would like to volunteer to do various things that make the presentations like today happen. So let me know, or anybody at the table, Michelle and Bob. Uh, and I bring you greetings from Sarah, the Executive Director of the Montpelier Senior Activity Center. She had hoped to welcome you herself, but she's at a meeting. So um, this is our first, the, the kickoff to our first full term since March 2020, so it feels very special. And though we, we certainly haven't seen the last of COVID, it feels good to, to be together again. And, um, and to, to add to the feeling of kind of normalcy, we're delighted that after the presentation, I want to invite you to enjoy cider and the wonderful goodies baked by Amalia De, Sef De Stefano. We haven't been able to have uh, refreshments before this, but we can now. So stay afterwards, talk about what you've heard, just socialize, get to know each other. Anyway, we have a terrific opening today. I don't think we could be talking about anything that's more current or more relevant than um, what today's speaker is going to bring to us. Diane Derby is a familiar name and face when she takes off her mask. To many, <laughs> to many in, in this area, she's, she was a longtime journalist with the Free Press and with the um, Vermont Press Bureau here in Montpelier and she covered where she covered the legislature and various and the administration of Governor Dean. She was asked to join the DC staff of Senator Jim Jeffords in 2001 and she remained with him and his staff until his retirement. Shortly thereafter she served um, I think was it 10 years as a field representative and outreach worker here in Vermont for Senator Leahy. And she left that job just about a year ago. Um, now she has um, recently returned to her journalistic roots, joining Vermont Digger as a senior editor as of last March. Diane will share with us the insights she gained from working as an insider in the national political arena. She'll discuss with us the challenges we face and try to elicit ideas for dealing with these difficult areas. Diane. Thank you. It's so nice to see familiar faces. I, I always said the reason why I've not been a politician in my life is A, I hate raising money, and B, I, I get nervous about public speaking, which was a tough thing for me as a spokesperson for a U.S. Senator. <laughs> so, so I've made some notes, so I, I'm not going to read from any script, but I just want to remind myself of where I'm trying to go with all of this. So thank you all. Thank you, Edith, for the invitation. Great to have this speaker series back after a long hiatus due to COVID. And great to see all of you here. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, Edie gave you a brief uh, wrap up of my bio sketch. Um, I joined Senator Jeffords' staff. I was a longtime journalist, as she mentioned, at the, at the Press Bureau, which was the State House Bureau for the Rutland Herald and the Times Argus. I came to Vermont in the late 80s to work at the Free Press and then moved over to the Press Bureau and spent a decade covering state politics and policy. And, uh, pol you know, politics and so far as I covered the campaigns, congressional and state campaigns. And I, covered everything that went under in the legislative, well, not everything, but the legislative sessions for almost 10 years. Um, and uh, as such, I, I became very familiar with our congressional delegation. Um, and it was one of the things that really kept me in Vermont for a long time. When I moved to Vermont, I thought I'd only be here as kind of a hiatus from, you know, big city papers, and that I'd go running back to the Boston Globe or someplace where I interned. And, when I got here, I realized all of the politicians in Vermont were so incredibly accessible. I, I didn't have to speak to layers and layers of spokespeople, coming from a spokesperson, but, um, but I think that's really what kept me here for so long, both as a journalist and then after that as a Senate staffer. I just really appreciated in Vermont how 
we could really talk. I'm sure many of you have met, you know, one of our congressional delegation, delegate members in person, you know. I mean, I think we all have an experience of being at an event and, and reaching out and somehow having connections, which I think is really unique in Vermont. And I, for one, really appreciate that. Um, so, yeah, so that said, so my bio, uh, when Senator Jeffords left the Republican Party and became an independent in 2001, his chief of staff had reached out to me. I, you might remember I was working for the Department of Education at the time when Dave Walk was commissioner, and I think he and I both felt that we might have not been the best fit for those positions, and <laughs> he went to Castleton, and I went to D.C. to work for Jim Jeffords. Um, and, you know, the, 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 yeah, the ask came out of the blue. I really didn't aspire to go to D.C. and become a Senate staffer. Um, I just was on good terms with Senator Jeffords, chief of staff, a woman named Susan Boardman Russ. She's one of the Burlington Boardmans, and she was Senator Jeffords' longtime chief of staff. And I got to know her when I went to D.C. to cover the impeachment trial of Bill Clinton in 1998. Um, we all probably remember those days, um, back when impeachments, well, well I won't go there. Um, but I, I covered that, and Senator Jeffords had a big role in that, some, some might remember, um, in that he was the first Republican, he was still a Republican there, to declare that he would not vote to support the impeachment. He would not find Clinton guilty, and then a few Republicans fell in lockstep and suddenly the impeachment was over and, you know, the House had brought the articles of impeachment, but the Senate did not find him guilty in large part because of a few moderate Republicans at the time that voted um, against impeachment. And so that was kind of my first taste for the Senate in D.C. and the political scene down there. And it was really quite interesting to me, but I really didn't give deep thought about it until Susan called me and offered me the job. Um, after. Senator Jeffords left the Republican Party, he took on, he became part of the, he didn't, he caucused with the Democrats, but he wasn't formally a Democrat, but for all intents and purposes, he took on new staff, he took on a chairmanship of, a, of the Environment and Public Works Committee, um, and he needed more, more staff. And so they brought me down as, as press secretary, and I took a little time off during the summer before getting down there, and um, lo and behold, 9-11 was my first day on the job on Capitol Hill. And yeah, I come down on Monday, unpacked things, started report to work, and you know, we all know what happened. Um, and so with that, um, you know, it was really, it was, you know, it, it really saddens me to remember those, th you know, you remember the sharpshooters and you remember the chaos and the Capitol Police yelling at you to run for your life. And, you know, there were just so many unknowns at the time and, um, you know, stuck it out. And then not even a month later, or just roughly a month later, we had the anthrax. And our office was a floor below Senator Daschle, and he got the envelope opened in his office. And um, we, we all had our televisions on having no idea about this anthrax uh, letter, a floor above us. And all of a sudden we had you know, people in Tyvek suits coming into our office and evacuating us. And so we were then out of our office for three months um, because of anthrax. Um, so needless to say, I, I was second guessing my decision to move to DC for a while. And I don't say that lightly. I seriously was considering coming back. And I'm, I'm glad, you know, that I didn't. But it was, you know, it was a, a pretty amazing journey when I got there. Um, so now I'll tell you a little bit about what it's like to work in a Senate office. And I, I want to offer a few caveats here. I'm not a Senate historian. I'm, I'm not in the weeds on all of the long history. Um, so I don't want to come off sounding like I'm an expert on, on the Senate. Um, I, the span of my time there was from 2001, then a few years off after Senator Jeffords retired. And I went back here to the Senate with Senator Leahy in 2011. And, re and technically retired, didn't really retire, but left his office just, as Edie said, about a year ago. So what I wanted to do today is just cover the span from like 2001 to 2021, a 20-year span, 
noting that I took a few years off in the middle to do other things and came back to it because I was really excited by what happened, you know, the, the daily grind, if you will, of the Senate. It really, it was a lot like journalism. Journalism, you never knew what you were going to be covering that day, and in the Senate, it was kind of the same thing. Nothing was predictable. Um, and, you know, I don't have any tell-all stories. You know, I'm trying to offer insights, but I, I want to also stay non-judgmental and as best as I can non-partisan about it. Um, I'm sure everybody has different thoughts on this. Um, and, you know, so everything I say is just based on my observations and political experience. And because I do work for a news organization now, as Edie said, I'm a senior editor at the DT Digger. Um, and I've come full circle back to journalism. So I, I also just want to keep my opinions somewhat to myself um, for those reasons. Um, but, and I'll open this up to q and I don't plan on talking a real long time because... I know that gets boring, so I'll, I'll gladly take questions um, after I talk a little bit. But, you know, I was asked to talk about, you know, from the insider's perspective, and I think the best way, I think the question I want to kind of arrive at here um, is how do we get where we are, right? We all know that there's total gridlock. Um, things aren't getting done in the best interests of our country and our people sometimes. Um, and you know, I'll just say I thought it was bad when I left the Senate, when Jeffords retired in 2007 and I came back to Vermont and I thought maybe I'll go back to D.C. when it's a little less partisan. Um, and obviously it's just gotten really more partisan since then. Um, and I think we saw the accumulation of all of the things that have transpired in 20 years with what happened on January 6th. That's in my estimation. So I want to get for a minute to... Uh, again, that 20-year span, and what I think has led to some of this partisanship, not only partisanship, because I think the partisanship is also a reflection of where we are as a country. It's not just the Senate and the House members. You know, people are electing their representatives, and we're a country that's torn apart, and um, I think it's representative in the, in the Senate and House, but I think it's a, a much bigger issue. And I think there are two things at play here. And, you know, one, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not a PowerPoint person, but this is a step, this is a good map. You can see the red states versus the blue states. Um, and I think, you know. Can I move the mic closer to you? Oh, so sure. I can't hear you. Okay. Sorry. Okay. I'll try to be closer to the mic. Um, but, you know, all you have to do is look at that map and see that there's a whole swath of red states and there are blue states and it's a country divided, right? And then, of course, every year at the midterms or the four-year election cycle, we have this wild flip between Democrats and Republicans, which is going on in four and eight-year increments. So um, I only offer that by way of saying I think what we see in Washington is a reflection of, you know, the country as a whole. Um, and I think I'm going to trace some of this back in my experiences, again, from the insider view to 9-11 and what happened in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, because I think it's really important to view it um, somewhat. It's not entirely the reason, but um, three big things happened immediately in the aftermath of 9-11 when we saw the passage of the USA Patriot Act. Um, and some might remember, that was signed into law, if you think about this, uh, just over a month after the 9-11 attack. Um, it was October 26 in 2001, and Congress passed this very sweeping surveillance bill that allowed the government to tap phones and hold um, people in indefinite attention, detention, rather, excuse me. Um, even librarians found themselves being subject to inquiries about what books were be being read. I mean, I, I think we all remember that that was just kind of a tough time. Um, so that's the first big piece of post 9-11. Um, then we saw the Iraq War um, resolution passed in Congress, the vote passed in Congress uh, in October 2002, um, authorizing military force and you know, there were 23 senators who voted against that, and our 
two delegates, or two senators, Jeffords and Leahy, both um, opposed that largely on the belief it was based on false information, which we only later proved that it was. Um, and then the third thing that I think has led to where we are, I mean, there are many things that have led, but these are the three things related to 9-11. We saw the creation of the Department of Homeland Security. Um, and that was in November of 2002. And that had the effect of combining 21 departments that already existed between justice and treasury and various other places within the government. And it created the third biggest cabinet office in our government after DOD, Department of Defense, and, and um, Veterans Affairs. And that just expanded the purview of the immigration, you know, the ICE um, immigration policing. It expanded the purview of TSA and airports. It, um, you know, it, it was just so sweeping. And it even brought FEMA into its control, the, the, you know, which traditionally had been an organization called out Natural Disaster Relief. Um, and so, uh, we saw three years later what happened when FEMA was called out in Hurricane Katrina. They were just not prepared because, you know, their mission had changed so much um, under the DHS approach. Um, and during that time, we also started seeing, um, particularly the Republican Party in the Senate, line up lockstep. Um, when I came to D.C., Senator Jeffords, he had since left the Republican Party, but he was long known in kind of joking terms as a rhino, a Republican in name only. Um, and he proudly wore this rhino tie. <laughs> and he was very proud of, of being an independent, even while he was a, a Republican. And I won't, you know, rehash all the details of why he left the Republican Party, but it was largely over his differences with President Bush early in Bush's first term. This is Bush too, George Bush, George W. Bush. Um, over special education funding, he was upset that um, the president had not come through on a, on a pledge, and he also opposed the, the president's tax packages. So um, my point, tax break packages. So my point being that um, Senator Jeffords was one of about seven or eight Republicans uh, at around the year 2000 who you never knew where their vote was going to take them. You know, they were all independent rhinos, Republican name only. And that, you know, that was something that was a given for much of Senator Jeffords' career in, in D.C. People never knew really how he'd come down on the next vote. He was never lockstep as you know, there were Arlen Specter, who later became a Democrat, who, you know, uh, uh, Olympia Snow in Maine. There were a number of them who caucused together as rhinos. And that was okay until it wasn't. And there came a time after 9-11 and the Bush administration, and maybe it had something to do with Jim Jeffords' defection, but, you know, suddenly there were no rhinos left in the room. And it was a bad word, and you could not be an independent Republican. And, Democrats tried to file suit, follow suit, but I think as, as we've seen with the uh, Senator Manchin issue, um, I don't think the Democrats have been, whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, they just have not been as effective as the Republicans in lining up their, their caucus, lining up their members in lockstep for the votes. Um, so, you know, I think the, the loss of moderation um, and the loss of independent, you know, the ability of senators to, to think and act independently um, on both sides of the aisle has been a big loss um, for the country in terms of how the representation, I'd say both on the House and Senate side. I'm only speaking to the Senate side because the House side, you know, I just, I wasn't there on a daily basis and I really am not familiar as much with the operation. It's 435 members and that it's unwieldy. <laughs> so um, these are my observations just working in the Senate. And um, so, you know, this all played out in the 2000 to 2006 area. And, um, and then I left DC in 2007 after Jim retired. Um, and then we saw, you know, as I said, I left thinking it would come down and I might come back. And then we saw the rise of the Tea Party. 
And again, I think these are all these pressures that have been building over the years. Um, it's easy to think like a lot of the partisanship and the patriot, you know, kind of patriotism that you hear about with the patriots who stormed the Capitol. It's easy to think about that in terms of the, you know, in terms of the, um, you know, in terms of the Trump administration and what's led to that. But I think what I'm trying to show here is that, you know, it's, I don't think it's coincidental that it was called the USA Patriot Act and that these are the patriots who are now storming our capital. Um, I think, you know, and also, some, this is not my observation, but a lot of young men particularly came of age after 9-11 and joined the military. And what you saw in a lot of the arrests that were made at the Capitol after January 6th were um, men of a certain age, who, a lot of them who had military backgrounds um, and who referred to themselves in some form as, as patriots and you know, truly were going on the notion that they were upholding you know, what they saw as a false election. I won't go there, but um, I think we all, we all are aware of how that played out. I mean, so during my years uh, with Senator Leahy here in Vermont, it was nice to have a little, a little space between what happened in D.C. and what happened on the ground in Vermont. Um, and I think, you know, in Vermont, I'll just say that I don't know. Can I just see a show of hands? How many of you have ever reached out to your congressional offices for help? Okay, yeah, good enough. That's great. Um, I think what people don't often recognize about these offices, the Senate and House offices, the delegation, is we do a lot of constituent service work on the ground in Vermont, and you don't get that as much in D.C. Um, in D.C., you get a lot of requests for tour guides and things like that um, from Vermonters who are coming to visit, but the real one-on-one -on -one work with your constituents, I would argue, is on the ground in the home state. Um, and that really, I just felt so much closer to the work that I felt was important in Vermont on the ground, working for Senator Leahy, um, where the work in D.C., I was Senator Jeffords' spokesperson, and it was a lot of press releases, it was a lot of committee work. Um, it's all very important work, but after 20 years looking back, I think the most effective and most important work is the constituent work that they do on the ground. And these offices in Vermont, I think, are just really good. All three offices, you know, Welch, Sanders, and Leahy, and Jeffers before that. Um, and, you know, the casework that goes on, getting people the right fittings for winter tires for wheelchairs. I mean, it goes, you know, it, it just, there's so much casework and, and Medicare issues and cutting through the red tape of government. Um, that's not the work I did. I was not a caseworker. I was a field representative, which means that um, given that Senator Leahy was chair of appropriations or at least vice chair when I was with him for much of the time and, and before that he was chair of judiciary and vice chair of judiciary committee. Um, so a lot of my work was related to his, his work in the committee so which translated in Vermont to me being able to work with organizations that needed funding, needed federal funding and going out and, and assessing what they did and what they needed and trying to match the federal funding that the senator could could pull into the state with the needs that were out there. This is outside the realm. You might have heard of earmarks in a, in a bad way, but I, I will maintain that earmarks have been used inappropriately um, around the country, but I think we do a pretty effective job in Vermont of trying to target earmark money. Not all the time. Sometimes it's out there in terms of what gets funded with federal funds, but for the most part, um, as a staffer, my job and other staffers' jobs were to try to align the needs of Vermonters and organizations uh, with some of that federal money. Um, and so for the last 10 years, that's largely what I did, but I, I also was uh, Senator Leahy's point person with law enforcement agencies around the state. Um, and Senator Leahy, as you might know, is a former state's attorney. Um, he's also a strong civil rights advocate, so uh, sometimes those two things were a little bit at odds um, with all that we've seen with law enforcement issues lately. Um, but so I, I you know, worked on Department of Justice funding to the state of Vermont, um, and, you know, again, I, I think 
that that's a, a, a largely overseen aspect of what a Senate office does. So Senate office has a personal staff in state. So we have a staff in Burlington for Senator Leahy of about 12 people. We have a small office in Montpelier that's another two or three people. I say we, we did, I'm out of it now, but I still say we. Um, so he has basically 15 people on the ground in Vermont, which is not a huge staff given that you're statewide. You get all around the state. Um, but I absolutely loved going around the state and just trying to target what the needs were with what the, the funding possibilities were. Um, you know, and, and all, all of that is to say that <laughs> I, I think, you know, I'm afraid the politics and the division and all of the bad taste that people have about politics um, can sometimes overshadow the good work that's sometimes done in Senate offices and what can be possible. Um, and I think in Vermont, we still have a mission to, to do what's really needed um, and to try to target that. And as for, you know, the future looking forward, I, you know, there is no magic bullet. Um, and when I left the Senate last year, you know, I, I was just worn out. I couldn't listen to the news anymore. It was just too depressing. Um, and I, I really felt at a low. And then I switched over and found my roots again in journalism. And I just feel that I, you know, that I almost feel like we can be as effective in journalism as, as we can be in political work um, in trying to change systems, trying to find inequities, trying to really show where, where needs are and where systems fail. Um, and I think certainly, uh, you know, I, I don't want to inject opinions, but I think our federal government is, is just going through a time where, um, you know, it's not meeting the needs of a lot of ordinary people. Um, I think the Affordable Care Act is the last thing that we did. Well, there's been all of the ARPA money, all of the response to the COVID pandemic was really critical. And I can tell you, I did a lot of work with arts organizations and performance venues and um, businesses that uh, were very close to just going under during the pandemic. And I think that's one example where the government really um, did come through on a lot of funding and managed, I mean, now we're seeing the results with inflation, but it, it, you know, without that kind of aid pack, there were three major aid packages in response to COVID from the federal government. And without that, I think we would have seen a country in a lot worse shape right now. So, you know, I think in those instances, um, you know, I think the Affordable Care Act, as I said, you know, which had became, you know, the lightning rod of political division, um, but has helped so many millions of people keep health care and, you know, I think to keep our eye on, on what it is that we need to do at the federal level is so important. Um, so with that, um, I think I'll just, I, you know, I'd love to just have more of, a, more of an interactive discussion here and, and take questions. But I also just want to, you know, close on saying um, a couple of quick, if, if no one has read, if anyone in the room has not read the Sunday New York Times Magazine piece um, that recently, it was on, in August 25th, Sunday Magazine um, of the New York Times on Jones Day, which is a big law firm in, in DC, and the effect that this law firm had on the selection of judges going back 20 years. Um, and, you know, I haven't gotten into talking about judge nom judicial nominations. Um, that was a big part of Senator Leahy's career as head of judiciary and then, and then ranking, you know, ranking member, the, the minority member lead. Um, the, the Senate has largely gotten to a place where, and, and I think it's changed a bit with Biden and the Democrat control, but for years, for many years, we did not see any legislation going through the Senate. There was very little true legislating. And it was so focused on making judicial appointments. That was much of the work. We, in 2013, we passed a comprehensive immigration bill in the Senate um, Judiciary Committee. 
And I, I could almost say, I'm sure there are exceptions, but that was the one major piece of legislation, the last major piece of comprehensive legislation that was passed in Senate, and it never made it to the Senate floor for a vote. Um, but that was the kind of thing we could do in the Senate um, to really change and make, make policy. And that just doesn't happen anymore. We're just not making policy. And the big thrust for eight years was to nominate judges to the bench who would support a certain view. And the Republicans were very successful in doing that. And, um, and as a result, you know, we're seeing at the Supreme Court level, we're seeing it at many levels. And I think that is going to be the long lasting um, effect, if you will, on somewhat of a paralyzed Senate. Um, and that, you know, while we were kind of focused on some other big shiny object, if you read this story in the New York Times um, magazine about Jones Day, and I'll gladly share the link if, you want, if you'd like, but if you just Google New York Times Jones Day, Jones Day is a major big law firm. And this story was stunning in that um, this law firm, working with Mitch McConnell, and some very far right groups were making all the decisions on who to nominate as judges and would take those lists to the White House. Um, and it was all very much out of the public eye. And in my mind, like, this was probably the most significant change in how things were done in Washington in my 20 years there to imagine that these meetings were going on with a lot of private interests represented. And I wouldn't even start talking campaign finance issues, but this one story to me shone a light on what's really wrong and why the system isn't working in the best interests. Um, so I'll, I'll just leave you with the thought uh, to, to go back and have a read of, of that article. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm happy, I don't know what your interests, I don't want to, uh, you know, if you have questions about how Senate offices operate, I'm happy to answer those. I just, I don't want to prescribe the, the field of what I'm covering here. Um, as I said, I don't have any great insights as a longtime Senate staffer other than really sharing the feeling that a lot of Americans have that something needs to change. And I wish I could say what that change is. And I think it comes with the next generation. Um, and I think, I wish I had a magic ball, so I could get crystal ball rather, so I could like see what happens 10 or 15 or 20 years from now. Because um, it really is certainly uncertain times. And um, I, I, I think money is obviously the big issue that we all recognize. Um, and I don't see anything changing in the courts, largely because of that judicial system that we've now got in place. So I wish I had better news. <laughs> um, but I think it's so important for the public to feel that they have a say. Um, and I think we live in this microcosm of Vermont where, you know, we, the, you know, we feel we're represented, you know, it, I remember being once interviewed by C-SPAN about an upcoming race back when I was at the State House, and the, the interviewer said, what have you got in the water in Vermont? You've got Bernie Sanders, you've got, you know, Jim Jeffords, the Republican, Bernie and, and Patrick Leahy, and at the time I think we had the Republican government, no, it was during Dean, but he said, you're just all over the map politically, you know? <laughs> And I said, yeah, good observation. I think we are, but it seems to work for Vermont, you know, and, and that's where we're at. So I just would love to take questions because I'm not good at standing up and talking about myself. <laughs> yeah? I'm interested in how, do, how does the speaker, or the, how does the majority leader rise up? Like, how did it happen that it's Mitch McConnell and Schumer? And what do they have to do to be in those positions of leadership, which just seems so crucial? And again, we don't have any say. Right. It's largely the caucus that decides that. And it's, it, it used to kind of be more based on seniority, but now it's just, you know, if it were seniority, we'd have Patrick Leahy as the, as the majority leader right now, right? But um, it's largely based on the, uh, the caucus and who 
I mean, Schumer was is an ambitious man, you know, and he definitely wanted to be the Senate Majority Leader, and um, you know, they don't want to spill out the the bad stuff in public. So a lot of it's just done privately in their own caucus to decide who rises up. Um, and so it's a, like I say, it used to be more based on seniority, and now it's just based on the vote of the caucus. And um, you know, Chuck Schumer worked hard to become Senate Majority Leader. So it's not. What, what, that, what, what, what's entailed in that work? Oh, it's a, you know, it's largely well. There's Senate Majority like when Mitch McConnell was was the Senate Leader, the Senate Majority Leader. He made all the decisions of what came to the floor for a vote and what didn't. Um, and I'd say back when I started in the Senate, there was a lot more committee work being done. So a bill would start in committee, the committee chair would decide, usually in consult with the, the ranking, the ranking is the minority leader in the, on the committee. So there are 16 standing committees. and. We, I, I would argue that we used to do so much more work in the committee to get a bill passed. Um, I think of Jim Jeffords pushing in 2001 or two when he was first chairman to get a carbon reduction bill passed in the Senate. And um, he worked so hard on that. And it just, he was the chairman at the time and he couldn't get Democrats to all line up on that. Um, and so you get a lot of work done at the committee level, and then the bill passes the committee, hopefully, and will go to the Senate, and traditionally, you just, once the committee chair got the bill out, it would go, and the Senate majority leader would take it up on the floor. And oftentimes, it was a bipartisan agreement what we would take up. It wouldn't always be just what that the majority wanted, but that has just changed over the years. So the majority leader holds a tremendous amount of sway. Um, when, when Chuck Schumer took over in January as majority leader, sorry, 2021, um, he made a grand pronouncement that the Senate will legislate. Um, and, and that, you know, you hear him say that and you think, gee, why would he even have to say that, you know? Why, why is that even a point? Of course the Senate's going to legislate. But if you look at the history of what happened in the eight years prior, there was very little actual work. I mean, the most basic, obvious point is passing the 13 appropriations bills that we have to pass to keep government running. You know, and how many times have we heard of government shutdowns and we're coming up now to the end of September and that's the end of the fiscal year and I think I lived through three or four government shutdowns um, when we had to just quit working and close up, close up shop and go home and wait for it to be over. Um, so the basic elements of what gets done or what doesn't get done are largely guided by who the majority leader is, hopefully in consult with the minority leader, but certainly not always. Um, so it is, you're absolutely right, it is a very important function, it's a very important role. McConnell and Schumer um, both have a pretty tight lock on, on that leadership right now, and I mean, as does Pelosi in the House. Um, you know, and unless I think you really mess up somehow in that, you, you stay leader for as long as you want to be a leader, unless there's some dramatic revolt within your caucus and they vote you out. It doesn't happen that often. Diane? Yes. I'm curious, for the last several years, I've, I've thought to myself, and I'm sure many of you have thought, there's a Liz Cheney, there's an Adam Kinzinger, there have to be more than two in the two. Chambers. Yeah. Yeah. Are there, I mean, what, what do you hear behind the scenes? Are there people who just won't speak up, but who yeah. have some moral cores still left? Or are they is it all just... Oh. You're putting me on the spot here. You, yeah. you know, I think with those two names you just mentioned, Cheney lost her primary, right? And so she paid the price, and um, the, other, the, the other gentleman is retiring, so... If, if you're retiring, you have more of a basis to stand on that. But I, you know, I think that's the bold boldness that we need, or people like those two to stand up to their own party. Are there others in the, in the, in the you know, chambers? again, I can't speak as much to the House side. On the Senate side, that's where I was speaking to the Rhino issue. You know, so you've got, I think there were seven Republicans who voted for impeachment the last time after the uh, 
January 6th event, so the vote was like 57 to 43. And all of those Republicans who voted for the impeachment were singled out. And one guy running in Missouri, who used to be the governor, ran this campaign ad with guys with weapons and flak jackets and said, we're going rhino hunting. Um, and it was like so scary. If you watch the video, it was like, how could this be that he's running for the US Senate and he thinks this is OK? I, I never followed up to see if he won his primary. Maybe it hasn't happened yet. But, um, and he's the former governor of Missouri. And the ad was super scary, and they took it right down off Facebook. Um, I haven't even talked about social media and the effect of social media, but I think we all know how it filters in. It just, um, it's really a, 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 a poison. Yes? Do you see this as the end of democracy and, and the use of big money corporations and perhaps just what capitalism has done to our democracy? Um, you know, I, I, I think we came dangerously close on January 6th. Um, I don't think there's any denying. And I, I think, um, again, I, I, I'm trying not to be partisan here, but I, I think there's a real danger ahead if you know, certain um, falsehoods still maintain this energy that you know, we had a false election. And, you know, the, and that, again, is fueled by a lot of social media. Um, I, I do think a, a large number of people were brainwashed into really believing all of that to be true. And I think it's proven time and time again it wasn't true. And some of these people realized that after they got hauled into court and, you know, talked at length. I don't know. You know, I read a lot of the stories of people who were convicted in connection with that. And some of them were just very upfront and talked very specifically about and, and saw the ways after they were convicted and serving jail time of how they were manipulated. Um, I think a lot of the answer lies in what our response is and what happens in the next four years um, and how successful our country is in, in overcoming. I mean, history just, we've seen it all through history, right? Um, and it's just always been a little farther distance and to see it in our own country. It's just very different. As for the, the money, I, I don't know how you get rid of money unless you overturn Citizens United. And I don't see that happening with the current state of Supreme Court. Yeah. Um, I've been reading that there's been a lot of uh, misuse of COVID money being discovered. How do you think that played out in Vermont? Do you feel that in Vermont we handled it fairly? So that's a good yeah. question. Um, so I have to say, I think it was overwhelming how fast money was coming into the state. Um, and for good reason, like we needed that money. Um, a lot of the COVID business, like the PPP loans that you hear about, the payroll protection loans, that all went channeled through the um, SBA, Small Business Administration office. And I can tell you that I worked next door to that office and they're an office of about four or five people on any given day. And they had enormous workload to, you know, because you couldn't wait six months. These people needed those loans. I think what you're going to see, I think in Vermont generally, you know, it's a small, it, it, Vermont's like a big city, right? It's a few, five, 640, 50,000 people. It's not a big, so, you know, it's hard to stand out as a true fraud, <laughs> a fraudulent operation in, in Vermont, because it doesn't take a lot. But, you know, you see some of the stuff that happened in Rhode Island with the COVID money to, like, absolutely fraudulent farms um, that got millions of dollars. And I think eventually the federal government will claw back a lot of that, but in many cases, obviously, the money is gone and they'll never see the money again. I think in the big balance of things in Vermont, I think that money was well spent. Um, I'm sure there are cases where there was some fraudulent activity or money wasn't really needed but never got returned. It was used, I think, in a lot of cases as a safety net for companies that didn't know if they could hold on to employees, so they got the 
payroll protection is just one of, of many pieces of that pot, but that, that was the big one to keep businesses afloat. No doubt there's some fraud when you put out billions of dollars in, in a small amount of time. Um, but to the, to the defense of some of the federal agencies that had to administer that money, it's not like they saw a huge increase in their staffing levels. Um, so I think generally it was very, it was money very well spent. A lot of it went back to communities, you know, Montpelier saw a few million, and, um, every community saw a little piece of it. And then you had the big infrastructure spending bill, which I think we'll see play out over the next few years. That's a, that's a very large investment in, in communities. Um, but I, I like to think that in Vermont, we didn't see a lot of fraud on a national level. We sure did. Yeah. So. Yes? Do you think there's any hope that the uprising of women in response to the Roe v. Wade Supreme Court decision might cause some changes towards democracy? Um, you know, I, th I think there's no doubt that, um, I'll, again, I'll have to, through a political view, I, I think Democrats are seeing that as something that will weigh in their favor in November at the midterm elections. And it will also bring out more female candidates. You know, I, I think, um, sorry for the men in the room. I'll just say it. We need more women <laughs> representing <laughs> our country. I mean, we're just, there's a, you know, and, and, um, and I, I think we'll see a lot more activity. Uh, one thing that's happened in Vermont is uh, the growth of Emerge Vermont, which tends to be, be a democratic-leaning training uh, for women who want to go into politics. And it started with um, Madeline Cunin um, probably about 10 years ago. And the number of women who uh, were successful in primary races um, who have come through Emerge just in this last cycle. It, it's really shown that you need training. You can't just step in the realm of politics and, and not understand that you need to raise money, you need to have lists, you know, you lists of donors. You need to, there's a lot that goes into even a small campaign, um, even for state reps at the state house. Um, there's a lot of training, there's a lot of background that you need to know to be successful unless you run unopposed. Um, so, you know, back to the row question, I, I think the Democrats are seeing that as um, something that will prove in their favor. I think, as we saw with the Kansas vote, and I don't know if you followed the Kansas vote, um, that was not framed in a question of are you in support or against abortion rights. It was framed in terms of personal privacy rights. And, and that was how the Kansas voters saw that question because that's how it was framed. And I think if you watch TV in Vermont, you're seeing a lot of Maggie Hassan ads for the US Senate um, and her opponent in a very Republican state um, is you know, against abortion and, and the ads that are being run um, in support of Hassan talk about how her opponent wants to, you know, limit your individual freedoms. And in New Hampshire, that's, that's something that rings loud. So it's not about abortion per se, it's about individual freedoms and privacy. Um, so I think in different states, it's gonna be cast differently. Um, but I think that Democrats are seeing that as a plus, and I think Republicans have, I mean, just, you can read the newspapers and see that that's of concern that they're you know, they're running against some of that. Yes, we So you always hear about lobbyists sending money, sending money to influence votes. How effective are constituents when they're asked to either write to your congressional person, mm -hmm. contact your congressional person, call your congressional yeah. person, and also not necessarily yours, but maybe from another to another state, which is not your representative, and how 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 does that drive you all crazy? No, it doesn't drive us crazy. I mean, I was on the receiving end of many calls. I was the sole person sometimes working in Montpelier, and people would look up Leahy's number and find the Montpelier number and call. And so I often spoke to people, and we had a system in Senator Leahy's office, and it was all very much data driven, and we had a 
program that we opened for every constituent caller. Now, I'll be honest with you, we didn't want calls for out-of-staters because you just, A, don't have the bandwidth, and B, you're representing constituents of Vermont. You're not representing people in West Virginia. Um, so I'll just be blunt and say it really doesn't work well to call someone in another state. Um, yeah. I think it, it, but it is effective to call to your congressional office because we not only log every call, we'll ask, we'll ask for your identification, um, and that's important to us. Not, you know, I understand people have privacy concerns, but it's important to be willing to identify yourself if you call, um, because we need, we need that to know you're a Vermonter. Um, but we log every call, we write notes on every message, we put it under a category, so, you know, for the Supreme Court nominations, our phones would light up and we would log every day how many calls came in, pro or con Kavanaugh. Um, and, and those reports get generated and sent down to DC from Vermont. Um, it's funny when you, you know, talk about um, some, of the, some of the odd moments. Um, whenever Fox News comes on and says something against your senator, our switchboard lights up. Like, <laughs> It lights up from across the country with, often with really foul stuff. Like if they don't like, you know, I bring this up because in the Kavanaugh hearing when Patrick Leahy was going against Brett Kavanaugh and some of his, you know, questioning some of his past statements, the phones, we, you know, sometimes you just have to take the phone off the hook and they're all out of state calls, you know. Um, and they can get really nasty. But I have to tell us one story. Um, this is unrelated to that, Ruth, but so to finish that thought, it, it is very important, but it's important to call your delegation. I don't think it, it has much effect to call outside of your delegation. Um, but those votes are all recorded and all you know, tallied, and it, it definitely uh, gets, gets notice. Um, when I worked for Senator Jeffords, I, I was only, I was pretty new to the, to the office, and it was in September of 2001, and we were still getting hate mail. We're getting some love mail, but a lot of hate mail um, after his switch, people who were really, really angry. Um, and, and we sorted it all through. I didn't do this. We hired Sister Elizabeth Candon. I don't know if any of you remember Sister oh, Elizabeth. Yeah. <laughs> so Sister Elizabeth was always a good friend of the office, along with Sister Janice Ryan. And Sister Elizabeth, at one time, for those of you who don't know her, she was the Agency of Human Services Secretary under Governor Snelling for years. And she's just a very sprightly, funny woman. She's now passed, but she was the person we put in charge of sorting through all of these letters. <laughs> and she worked in an office that was just above me in Senator Jeffords office, above uh, up the spiral staircase. And she would come down with a little glint in her eye and a smirk on her face, and she'd say, read this one. And <laughs> They got so, they were so nasty. <laughs> I wouldn't even repeat some of them. <laughs> um, but the nastier they got, the more, you know, Sister, Jan Sister Elizabeth just got worked up about these, you know, crazy responses that, you know, so I, I could only think, like, if only that letter writer knew that a Roman Catholic nun was reading your <laughs> response. <laughs> Um, I'm sure many of them considered themselves good Christians who wrote, um, who didn't like Senator Jeffords' decision, but I, I still think of Sister Elizabeth in that capacity. As a little bit of a detour off of your question, sorry, but it's, yes. Do you think this postcard writing campaign, uh, which is targeting voters in general, I don't think a specific party, will be effective in helping to get the vote out? Do you mean in Vermont or in generally? Generally, well, you know, I think for those of us um, in Vermont, many of you, I, I don't know, at least my experience, I live here in Montpelier, I got so tired of seeing the postcards for Becca Ballant, and with all due respect, they were a third party generated postcard, and sometimes I'd get three in one day. And maybe that's the post office, I don't know. but. I think there's a saturation point with postcards. You mean the ones you get or the ones you send? I'm sending. Oh, sending. I'm sorry. I but, thought you meant in general. But handwritten is different. 
Handwritten, um, again, it depends where you're sending it to. Are you sending it to your delegation? Or are you sending it to the president? Or are you sending Georgia. it to no, oh, the Georgia the voters? Yeah, to the states. Um, I'm sorry, there are a lot of different postcard efforts out there. Um, you know, I, I think, I used to go door knocking a little. I hated campaigns. Um, and uh, occasionally I'd take part in them. And oftentimes we'd get together as a group from Senator Leahy's office and go over to New Hampshire to try to help a candidate in New Hampshire. And the people of New Hampshire were so tired of being told how to vote. By the, as, the, as the season ended, you know, we got doors slammed in our faces. They just didn't want to hear from people. I think for these key states, like in Georgia, um, I, I think it's going to be largely on the campaigns. I'm not sure that handwritten notes from another state to, do you mean to certain voters in the state of Georgia or to? No, the, these uh, do not name who to vote for a party. It merely, they merely say, the please get out and vote. Oh, uh, democracy okay. depends on our participation. Yeah, I gotcha. Sorry. I, yeah. There's a lot of different postcard efforts. Um, I, I guess I wouldn't have any more insight than anyone else on that front. I think everybody responds differently to being told to vote. I think, you know, I think the Secretary of State's office are where a lot of that lies. I mean, in Vermont, we are now seeing this big push in Vermont to, to get out the vote. Um, and there's some Secretary of State's office that want to quash the vote, right? And they've made it hard for people to vote and voter registration. And you've got to show your ID. And they've found various ways to make it difficult. Georgia's going to be fascinating. Um, and, and I think it's just going to be largely based on how much of the voting public comes out. Yeah. Yeah. How often do you receive, do I receive form letters from the office when I've asked a specific question yep. and I get a form letter it has nothing to do with what I asked or what I said and, yeah. and it's supposed to be an answer from the senator. And that drives me crazy. <laughs> I can tell you. Um, so those are often sent out and I I'll be the first to say I, I don't think the offices always do a very good job of responding directly, which is why I would suggest you call and talk to a real person live. If you have a, well, at least it gets recorded as what your opinion is. If you get, did you get a form letter in response to an inquiry you made online? Well, thinks about, I'm a healthcare advocate, and yeah. I'm always trying to You're Mary Alice Bisbee, right? Yeah. Yeah, I know your name. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, I, we appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you're right. You know, we've got to get rid of privatizing Medicare because we're yep. going to get nobody's going to have healthcare anymore. It's all yeah. going to be owned by all the big corporations and, and yeah. the Wall Street investors. Yeah, and I appreciate what you're saying about the responses. I, I have a real issue with those generated responses that get sent out from the office that are very generic and don't really address the, the immediate concern. We do get an enormous amount of inquiries. So, um, But again, I think your best bet on wanting to be heard is to call the office and talk with someone. And that way, your name and what you're saying will get registered. I, I, yeah, I wouldn't count, I'll be honest with you, the reality is there's no way that a U.S. Senator, even in a small state, can answer every inquiry from a constituent. It's just, you know, you can't personally sit down Unless and respond. Unless I have dollars in my pocket to give. Well, I, you know, I, I thought there is, I, I think if you're a huge corporation with certain members, that's true. But I think, again, I think our, our delegation's pretty responsive. I'm going to push back a little bit on that to say um, it's just that it's, it would be impossible to really get a personalized note each time to each constituent concern. There's just not capacity to do that. So oftentimes you're hearing from our legislative correspondents who write letters in response and the senator will review the letter, but it's just not as effective going through that you know, web form as it is to call the office in Vermont. I would call to one of the Vermont offices. And I think that's true for the whole delegation and taking liberties here, but I think for Senator Sanders and, and Congressman Welch as well. Yeah. Thank you. Considering the nation as a whole, what do you think the odds are of being successful in reversing some of the restrictions on voting 
considered being opposed by a minority and the majority. Yeah. Seems to me it's a slippery slope that yeah. if you lose control of the ability to get one right. free vote count. And that all goes back to the loss of democracy, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's scary what's happening in a lot of states and how difficult they're making it on people to just to vote. Can it be reversed? You know, again, I think it's largely, I mean, you think about it, um, you, you know, so much power is in the Secretary of State's office and all the gerrymandering that we've seen going on at, on the state by state level. Um, if it's going to be reversed, it's going to be at the state level. I don't think it's going to be happening. I, I don't know how we approach it. And, and maybe others smarter than I am have a much better view of how do you approach it from a national level to assure that one vote is one vote. Um, but we haven't been able to get a good handle on that in some states, as you see in Georgia and elsewhere. You know, I'm just going to make it very difficult, particularly for, you know, regions of persons of color and whatnot. Um, it'll just be made harder. Bob? What do you see as the future of the filibuster rule, oh. especially <laughs> if the Republicans take back the Senate? You know, I, I, I've i never wanted to project what might happen because I, I, if in I don't general think this way not sort of reflected why they thought they should keep it or why they thought yeah. they should get rid of it or yeah, I think my mic went out, so I'll just speak loud. I think just tell me if you can't hear me. I'm I'm pretty good at projecting. Um, you know, when I was in Senator Leahy's office, we we were getting a lot of heat because he would not just flat out say he's not in support of abolishing the filibuster. Um, and I think that's in large part. Um, I'm reading between the lines here. He's a true believer in the protocols and the traditions of the Senate, and he still wants to hold on to believing that the traditions. And, you know, where we started losing ground on the filibuster wasn't the Republicans, it was Harry Reid voting to allow, you know, to, to do away with the filibuster for judicial votes when we were in the majority, when Democrats were in the majority. And that was a slippery slope. I, at least, I'm not, again, I'm not a Senate historian, but, you know, it was like, okay, we'll do it just in this case. And then when the Republicans came to power, they seized on that and, and you know, used you know, filibuster to the best of their doing. Um, I really, I don't know what happens with the filibuster. I really don't. But I think it's just because, I mean, it's part of the reason why we're not legislating, you know, to get to the 60 vote threshold to bring up a bill when you've got a 50-50 split. It's impossible. Um, and even for things, you know, like the impeachment vote, 57-43, um, you know, things that make a lot of sense to be a simple majority, um, you know, it's just, it's made that much more difficult with the 60. So uh, it's definitely a major problem for why the, the government doesn't seem to be functioning well, but I have no idea where that goes politically. Yeah. I think anyone who projects they know is <laughs> Making it all up. <laughs> Diane, are you okay if we take one or two questions to share sure. our any, and then yeah. we'll perhaps formally end, and okay. then will you, can you stay around for a little sure. bit? Sure, absolutely. So, yeah. is there, are there one or two questions we'll end with? Yes. Do we have? Do you think we'll ever see the, the end to the electoral college? Oh, that's a tough one. Again, I hate to project what I think. Um, you know, when you look at how skewed the popular vote is versus the electoral vote, it's just kind of crazy in recent history what's happening there. Um, but I, I'm going to leave that to the, Senate, the historians to decipher because I'm really, I don't feel adequately prepared to, to even guess how that plays out. Here's a softball question for you. <laughs> what's your favorite restaurant in D.C.? <laughs> <laughs> Very funny that you should ask that. I, I used to live right on Capitol Hill, um, so I frequented. There was a whole row on Eighth Street near Eastern Market, if any of you know Capitol Hill at all. Um, and there was a there was a particular restaurant there, which I've forgotten. And it's been a while since I lived in D.C., but it was um, 
it was right on A Street, and I don't even know if it's still there. There's so many restaurants in D.C. And if you want Ethiopian food, you have your choice of 15 different Ethiopian foods in Georgetown. If you want, you know, so I think it's a hard one to say. You've got the steak places. You've got, you know, you, there's so much to choose from. But it, I do miss a lot of the options that were available in D.C. Not that Montpelier doesn't try. Uh, but, yeah, thanks. I want to thank you very thank much, you. Diane. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all coming out. So please uh, stay around, socialize, have some cider and cookies. Again, thanks to Amalia DiStefano. Um, and I'll remind you next week we're going to hear from Maudine Neal talking about uh, the a Ku Klux Klan in Vermont in the 20s. And it's an interesting story. She's written a book about it. Uh, she saw a picture. My understanding is she saw a picture in some family album of a white suited person and, she, and then it got her started researching this. So come next week and thank you for coming today. Thank you.